So we began the chapter by looking at financial risks for individual projects. And we saw that duration risk occurs in all financial projects. And that includes our increased probability of a bad outcome incurring more and more frequently as the length of the project increases. Then we looked at risk-free risk also in all financial projects, and that's what we talked about in the last chapter a lot, in the including inflation risk, interest rate risk, default risk, very small probability of default risk, and that's what we measured with this risk-free risk with Treasury securities. Next up is industry or market risk, and this has to do with any project that's not a Treasury project. When we're looking at a treasury project, we stop at risk number two, but for everything else, we keep going. So industry or market risk includes things like an industry-wide disruption, macroeconomic disruptions, like things like stock market crashes, stuff like that. And then finally, we looked at uh, project-specific risk, and that also is for all non-treasury projects. Again, treasury projects stop after risk number two. Everything else continues and has all four. And so the project-specific risk is all about this project's unique issues, things that can go wrong specific to this project, like maybe you have bad management, maybe you're a startup and you only have three contracts and you lose two of them, that type of thing. And then we looked at incorporating these risks into financial models of individual projects. And we realized that typically we're going to be evaluating our projects with these discounting equations. So we have this in PV form here, or we could say cash flow zero here. But in either case, we have a bunch of future cash flows that we're going to individually one at a time discount back to t equals zero by dividing them by one plus r to the ti where ti is the time of that cash flow and that gave us the idea that all of those four risks for a general project have to be incorporated into either the cash flows or the discount rate or both with of course the exception of duration time risk because that's built directly into the math of this equation Okay, so we wanted our models to make sure that we're measuring all our risks and we're not double counting risks. And we realized that we could put all the risks in the cash flows, all the risks in R, or some combination of the two. And how the four risks are measured by virtually everyone in the world, actually pretty much everyone in the world, but Warren Buffett, who does things slightly differently, um, works as follows. Um, in the discount rates, um, everybody in the world, but Warren Buffett includes the risk-free risk and an increment for industry or market risk. And in the cash flows, they'll try and put the project specific risk. And as I've said before, it built into our discounting equations, our duration risk is measured by time. So just uh, for out of interest, um, Warren Buffett discounts with only risk-free risk, and he puts his industry or market risk in the cash flows along with project specific risk. Again, he really is truly about the only one in the world I know who does that. What I've got for you here really is true for virtually everyone else in the world. Okay, so when we include risk-free risk and industry or market risk in R, we write R as RM, which stands for R market, or ROCC, which stands for our opportunity cost of capital. Okay, and these two are equivalent. They mean exactly the same thing, depending on what textbook or even what chapter of what textbook you're looking at, you'll see one or the other, but they mean the same thing. They always include risk-free risk and an increment for industry or market risk, okay? And so that means that we're going to put our project-specific risks in our cash flows, okay? And then these cash flows are gonna be called project risk-adjusted cash flows. So then we looked at two risk models. The first one was the opportunity investment model, which we'll be using for the rest of the term. So it's it's kind of kind of important. It's an opportunity cost of capital model, exactly like um, you might have learned about in macroeconomics. 
So then we need to know what is our opportunity cost of capital. Um, and all it is really, it's a discount rate that aims to measure our risk-free risk and an increment for market or industry risks. Again, we always write it as ROCC or RM, and it's often called for short cost of capital. So our opportunity cost of capital formally, in terms of a definition we can apply for problems, is it's going to be our known interest rate or discount rate for a diversified set of alternative projects with similar risks as the project we are evaluating at the moment. So with that in our pocket, let's see how this opportunity investment model works. So the whole idea here, the, the key, the objective of the model is to find ROCC. So it does it via three steps. First, we have to know what's our, what's our mission in life as an investor. If we're working in the new gas station division for Luke Oil, it could be um, to find opportunities for profitable gas stations in new Midwestern markets in the US. That would be a good investment mission. Here are a couple others. We invest in short-term securities with strong contractual guarantees. So these would be like one-year treasuries or CDs. A different investment mission could be, this might be for a hedge fund manager. We invest in high-risk, long-term asset-backed securities, which might be things like subprime mortgage-backed securities. So we have to know our investment mission. What's our purpose in life? And once we know that, then we want to find an opportunity cost investment that's compatible with our mission. And remember, our opportunity cost investment is that diversified portfolio of known projects with market or industry risks that fit our investment mission. And once we know that, this is a really great thing because once we know that, all we have to do is estimate the native R interest rate or discount rate for our opportunity cost investment, and that is our opportunity cost of capital. So that's how this model works. We need to know our mission. We need to find an opportunity cost investment compatible with our mission, and then we need to estimate the interest that we'll earn if we invest in that mission, and that's called our opportunity cost of capital. Question comes up, why do we want to specify diversified portfolio here in our opportunity cost investment? Why don't we just say a known project with market risks and risk-free risks that fit our investing mission? Well, the reason is this. This is true for pretty much all of investing. If we look at a graph with the number of projects in our investment portfolio on the x-axis and risk, this would be measured by um, dollar loss, um, volatility of gains, Etc. So I want to be not very specific about what I mean by risk here. It could be a lot of things. Um, but you notice if we have very few projects in our portfolio, we have a huge amount of risk. And we can cut this literally by about 50% by having about, when we get to about 30 projects, we're pretty much there. Um, so what, what we say in finance is that smart investors always invest in a diversified portfolio of projects because that automatically cuts down our risk. And that leads to the saying in finance that diversification as finance is one true free lunch. So we want to make sure that our opportunity cost investment takes advantage of this benefit of diversification. Okay, so some important properties of our opportunity cost of capital now that we have it is that we can make investments with our return of opportunity cost of capital at any time just by adding to our opportunity cost investment position. So this, again, to borrow from what some of you have seen in macroeconomics, maybe even in this case in your micro course here, our opportunity cost of capital is the rate we forego by pursuing a new opportunity instead of putting our money simply in our opportunity cost investment position. So our strategy for analyzing projects becomes, is the interest I'll get in this project bigger than what I would get if I just threw my money into the opportunity cost investment project and earned opportunity cost of capital? Okay. Other thing that's important is um, the riskier our investment mission, the higher our opportunity cost of capital is going to be. Um, and whenever we're discounting with our opportunity cost of capital, we want to use our project risk adjusted cash flows. 
Okay, so now the opportunity investment model has given us how to find ROCC. We also want to know how to measure our project specific risks. And those, of course, are going to be in our cash flows, right? So here's a good method for doing that that works with and really as part of our opportunity investment model. So we spent some time thinking about how to specifically measure our project specific risks in our cash flows. And to do that, we broke down this measuring of the project specific risk and cash flows into two different types of projects. The first was contractual projects, which were going to be things like bonds or loans, etc. And in this case, when we're looking at a contractual project, we wanted to distinguish between two types of cash flows. On the one hand, the promised cash flows, those are what's stated in a bond contract or a loan contract, and those are the best case cash flows. Those are the cash flows that are gonna incur from this project if nothing goes wrong. And nothing goes wrong means they include no measure of risk. And then by contrast, we wanted to think about our expected cash flows. And these were really statistically expected value flows. And these can include consideration of our project specific risks, where in general, to get these project specific risks, we wanna think about various scenarios for the project, what could happen what could go really well, that would mean we'd get all the promised cash flows. What could go wrong, that would mean we'd get less than the promised cash flows. And we want to put a probability onto each scenario and work things out from there, as we see in the example on the next page. So here's an example of how we do this. Let's say we're looking at a bond with a contract requiring a payment of 100 in one year. So 100 is the promised contractual flow. And then something that would be given to us is that our general manager or you, after you've gotten your awesome degree from um, Miami, you could, after a bunch of work, say, well, I believe about nine times out of 10, a company like this is going to meet its promise and give me the promised cash flows. But about 10% of the time, a company like this is going to make some bad management decisions that will cause them to default. This is not default caused to industry or macroeconomic recession. This is default just to bad management decisions. And I further, after a bunch of work, again, this would be given to us, my estimate would be that we would get in that case that one out of 10 times our cash flow one would not be the promised cash flow of 100, but it would rather be the cash flow we'd estimate of, say, $50. And the way to think about this is if we buy bonds like this a lot of the time over and over and over again, which is what we will do because it fits our mission, 90% of the times we will get the promised cash flows and 10% of the times we won't. And when we don't, we're going to get 50% of the promised cash flows. So then how we want to use this is we want to say, what's the expected value? So this expected value is just probability of getting the promised flow. So 90% times 100 plus probability of getting the flow if things go bad. So that's 10% times 50. And the weighted average of that is just adding this all up together. And that's 95. And the way to think about this is after we make investments like this many times, on average, we're going to get 95 per project. So the second way we wanted to look at putting our project specific risks in cash flows was to look at ownership type projects. These are projects where we're talking about equity investments, buying shares of stock, something like that. Okay, so we're still measuring project specific risks and cash flows, whether it's an equity project or a contractual bond or loan project. And for equity projects, a common methodology is to project out our cash flows for three equally probable scenarios. And we're just arbitrarily saying that these scenarios are all equally probable. So scenario A would be superior project execution. So things go, that would be better than expected. 
average execution would be yeah, our best guess for what's really going to happen. And poor execution is where, again, we think what could reasonably go wrong and how much is this going to reduce the cash flows if that happens. So we project out these three scenarios for all the future cash flows. And then we give each one a 33% probability and think about it from there. And if you work out the math on that, it's going to be usually pretty close to the average execution. So that's what we're just going to use for now. We'll get a little fancier in chapters, uh, chapter 13 and beyond. And then we closed out this chapter um, with some other, a look at other risk models in particular. We, we really just looked at one called the capital asset pricing model or CAPM. This is also an opportunity cost of capital model and it's used almost exclusively for stock investments. So here's how it works. It says we're gonna discount our project risk adjusted cash flows to an entity's owners. Remember, we're still we're talking about stock here, so we're talking about an entity's owners. Okay, um, we're going to discount these cash flows with what we're going to call RE or R equity in the model, where RE comes from this equation. RE is equal to our risk-free rate plus this thing called beta times our market interest rate minus our risk-free rate. So this is uh, increment for market risk in parentheses. So that's the, the CAPM model. I've got a lot of details on the CAPM model here that we are gonna have to come back to in a future chapter. Just know that it exists. It's an opportunity cost of capital model like the opportunity investment model, and it's used mostly for equity stock investments. Okay, and that's it for handout 10.